We've been talking a lot about patterns in this class, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about patterns. Um, there are, again, a variety of ways into the study of patterns in, in argument. Um, in the chapter that you've read for, for this module, um, I give a whole bunch of examples. Um, so let's just think a little bit about some of the basic formal and informal patterns that we've already um, encountered. So we've seen, for example, that there are these fallacious patterns, like the fallacy of denying the antecedent, where um, at this point we're pretty good at seeing how these would be, f how we can get to the bare structure of something like this. So, you know, we'll have these, um, these um, informal spoken or written versions of the fallacy and we'll be able to identify the parts of the um, parts of the argument the conclusion the premises we'll be able to use variables to represent declarative sentences and we'll be able to sort of map out the general structure here so you know if i encounter something like um, if i run a marathon then i'll be tired and I didn't run a marathon, therefore I'm not tired. Well, that's an obvious case of the fallacy. It's an example of the fallacy of denying the antecedent. So we've seen those kinds of cases. Um, we're, we will be spending a lot more time on the formal side of things later on. Um, we'll be studying how we can evaluate the validity or, the, or not of an argument. Um, We'll also be looking at informal fallacies. These are all patterns that, that are identifiably bad in, in one way or another. So formal fallacies, as we'll see in great detail going forward, are the errors that arise from misunderstanding logic or probability or statistics, most commonly. Um, and those are, those are cases along the lines of the fallacy of denying the antecedent, um, the fallacy of affirming the consequent, both of which we've seen already. Now the informal fallacies are a little tougher, um, and what we're going to say is that these are, are bad habits or patterns that serve as illegitimate impediments to excellence in inquiry and decision making. So the informal fallacies require a bit of subtlety for us to um, to to identify and evaluate, etc. There are often cases that look formally correct, um, but that end up being informally fallacious. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of those cases going forward, but for now, we might say that the fallacy of begging the question, for example, is formally perfectly fine, but it does if one commits the fallacy of begging the question, then one is falling into an, illegit an illegitimate pattern of reasoning um, because the fallacy ends up posing an illegitimate impediment to inquiry. So we're going to see um, these patterns appear in a variety of ways, and they sort of indicate a problem. So. If we think about some of the fallacies we'll be thinking of in um, in in terms of statistics and probability later, um, remember, well, I guess maybe we haven't touched on it yet, but the clustering fallacy, for example, um, or failures to understand statistical independence, both of which we'll 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 examine in detail. There. Um, difficult to identify. So for example, um, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy or the clustering fallacy works something like this. We've got this paradigm case of um, something faulty going on. Let me explain the fallacy to you in a second. And then we say that there are other analogous cases that share the same form or have the same pattern. So um, identifying, for example, disease clusters, etc., will have sometimes an analogous uh, structure as cases of the sharpshooter fallacy. You might be wondering, what is the sharpshooter fallacy? Let me tell you. So how does the sharpshooter fallacy work? Well, it works as an example. Um, they, there's a story, and then the story serves as an analogy. We can see what's wrong with the story, and then from there we see what's wrong with other cases by analogy. So how does the story go? It goes as follows. 
There's a barn. And there's a shooter. The shooter shoots at the wall of the barn. Let's say he just fires off. He comes, walks up to the barn, makes a circle around a cluster, and calls his friends over to see what an excellent shot he is. So clearly there's a problem here. So he's, after the fact of, you know, finding the cluster, he draws the circle around it and then claims that he is a sharpshooter because he's managed to concentrate his shots within this circle. So we see the obvious problem here. He's not a good shot. He is, after the fact, creating the target and then claiming that the shots fall within the target. We can see that this is illegitimate. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the, the Monte Carlo fallacy. We'll talk about that a little later. But in this case, we've got this story, um, and what we're going to say is that certain other kinds of cases fall under the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. This will um, commonly, for example, in cases of the identification of a source of a disease cluster, etc., we might worry that the sharpshooter fallacy is, um, is, is generating these, these results. So we might say, well, because five children in this elementary school developed, um, I don't know, leukemia, and since it's unusual that five children would have developed leukemia, then we can draw a circle around that school and say something must have been going on there. So that's a it's a really tricky case, and it's often not a direct analogy. So here we have to be super careful. We'll talk about this in great detail when we study some of the statistical fallacies. Um, for now, I just want to indicate that you know, here in the in the story about the sharpshooter, there's obviously a problem. And then that serves as a pattern for identifying other possible problems. Let's move on. In any event, if the pattern or the form of the argument is a bad one, then the argument itself is bad and should be rejected. The question, of course, is whether a particular argument fits the pattern or not. And as we saw in the case of the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, that might be open for, um, well, we'd have to think about that a little bit. In any case, if we find that it, that some argument does um, follow a, a bad pattern, then the argument should simply be rejected. Okay, so let's look at some some other patterns that maybe in a traditional logic class you wouldn't um, you wouldn't think about, but it's 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 worth worth our time to look at them. So we're going to look at a case, uh, the case of the sunk cost fallacy, and the sunk cost fallacy is an extremely common pattern of reasoning that you know we all engage in, and we all engage in it because we're all subject to what's called loss aversion. And um, I'll say a little bit about this. It's discussed in detail in the chapter. So let's look at the pattern, or let's look an at an example, rather. So here's an example of the sunk cost fallacy. Um, I say to myself, should I renovate the kitchen of this old house? Well, I'm not sure whether I, a new kitchen will make any real difference to the price of the house going forward when we're ready to sell it. And I really don't like cooking. I don't really use the kitchen that much. Um, but, you know, I've invested so much time, money, and energy in renovating the rest of this place. It would be a shame not to finish. So, okay, then I'll start working on it. I'll start working on the kitchen. So, Here's the here's the issue, right? So sunk cost works as follows. When I consider, you know, I've already spent so much time and energy renovating the place, it would be a shame not to finish. 
this kind of thing, the worry about the wasted resource, time or money invested. Okay, so this concern about the waste, it would be a shame not to finish it. Um, let's look at the pattern. There's a problem here. I hope you see it. Let's talk about the bare bones of the argument. So let's look at the pattern. Pattern runs as follows in the sunk cost argument, sunk cost fallacy. You begin with the question. The question is, should I continue this course of action? Should I keep putting money into this project? Should I keep working on this project? And the premise is, well, I have already invested a great deal of my resources in this course of action. And the conclusion based on that premise is, yeah, I should continue this course of action. Now, this by itself is a fallacious move. So when you move from the premise here to the conclusion, this is the mistake. So the mistake is saying that because I've already done so, so much, because I've already paid so much or invested so much time and energy, therefore I should continue. That by itself is illegitimate. Now notice that there might be good reasons to continue the course of action. Mm -hmm. There might be good reasons. So, you know, it might be the case that there are very good reasons for you to keep um, pursuing some, some particular course of action. Yeah, there might be. So it might be the case that, for example, the course of action is a good one. So that would be, you know, let's say, should I continue this course of action? Yes, it's a good course of action for some reason. OK? And you can maybe explain why it's a good course of action. But it's a good course of action independently of the fact that I've invested all these resources. So whether or not I've invested the resources is independent of whether or not it's a good course of action. So is it a good course of action, yes or no? If so, I should continue. But I shouldn't continue merely because I've already waste spent <laughs> rather, excuse me, spent money or time or energy on that course of action. So by itself, it's an whoops, excuse me. This is the pattern that's fallacious. This is the inference that's a fallacious inference moving from this to this, right? And why? Well, because the mere fact that you've invest invested time and energy into something is not itself reason to continue. The reason to continue is that it's good to continue. Let's look at some examples. So, for example, I know you're unhappy and our relationship isn't good, but we've been through this. We've been together for three years. You can't break up with me after all we've put into this. Okay, so this by itself is a classic example of sunk cost fallacy. Let's say, for example, this was spoken by a, a, an, an abusive spouse. Now, the the decision that the um, the victim, presumably, has to make is, should we continue or should we break up? The decision as to whether to continue should be independent of the fact that she's been in this abusive relationship for three years. Presumably, there has to be another good reason to continue other than the fact that the relationship has had has been ongoing for three years. Let's look at another one. So, happy land. This is the country that, um, that features in my examples. Happy land lost 21,435 members of its army, of our army, in Operation Destroy the Evil Ones. 
I'd like to remember the advocates of withdrawal, of ending the war, that we owe our dead something. We will finish the task that they gave their lives for. We will honor their sacrifice by staying on the offensive against the evil ones and building strong allies in the northern territories that will help us fight and win the war on evil. Okay, so I can't remember who said it, but the um, the problem here is the problem of you know being the last soldier to die for a for a mistaken war. I mean, who wants to be the last one to die? I don't think I, I'd like to be the first one to die for a mistaken war either. Um, but here the issue is, okay, is this really an argument for continuing the fight? So is the fact that these people have been killed, is it an argument for continuing the war. Now, there may be other arguments. There presumably would be other arguments for continuing the war. But the fact of the dead is not an argument for continuing the war. They'll be dead anyway. Okay, let's look at the next one. This slice of cheesecake is too big and I'm feeling full, but I shouldn't waste it. It cost me $8. Okay, so... The slice of cheesecake is uh, dauntingly big. It's no longer causing the person to feel any pleasure. <laughs> but the concern is, well, if I don't eat it, I will have wasted it. And it cost me $8. But presumably, um, the $8 is gone anyway. And now it's just a question of whether you're going to enjoy your <laughs> the remaining... <laughs> remaining few minutes or are you going to cause yourself to suffer because of the um, cheesecake on the table, the unfinished cheesecake that you're committing yourself to eating. All right. So that's equivalent to the fall to the last example. Uh, we just heard there's a great party at Mike's house, but we can't go because we have these tickets for a boring play. Um, again, this is the issue is, well, we've spent money on the boring play. Um, we can, and therefore we would be wasting the bo the the um, the money we spent if we went to Mike's house. But presumably, you know, we're trying to determine what's more fun here. So if you look at the if you look at the uh, discussion of loss aversion, we'll explain a little bit better, a little bit more uh, further what's wrong with um, with the sunk cost fallacy. Okay, I've gone on a little bit too long, sorry, but um, thanks.